wonderful grace. The message of grace is brought to you by Christian people who believe the Bible to be the Word of God and who appreciate its power and authority. Within the pages of the Bible itself, there's a God-given design for its study. Rightly divided, the Word of Truth is the key to understanding the Bible. We're glad you've joined us for an interesting look into God's infallible book as Richard Jordan, president of Grace School of the Bible, presents another in a series of messages designed to help you understand and enjoy the Bible. Let's join him now. We're certainly glad you joined us today. We trust that our time together in God's Word will be a rich blessing and help to you as we look again into the pages of the Word of God to see the things that God's Word communicates to us. It gives us the ability to have trust and confidence in it. You know, there's a great deal of, uh, of interest in, in, in Bible study that looks into the, the idea of finding the code to open God's Word for you. Uh, several years ago, someone wrote a book about the Bible code where they were looking for uh, what they call equidistance lettering and, and kind of all, all kind of, almost kind of spooky mystical stuff. And uh, they were finding all kind of hidden messages in the Hebrew text and in the Greek text. And the problem was that they found the, that some other people said, well, we can find something. And they went and found too much. <laughs> and it's sort of like the, the old thing years ago about backward masking, you know. People would take a record and play it backwards and say, well, you know, Satan's talking. And then somebody else come along and get, get a message from God on it. And it was just, it, it, the Word of God is not written in such a way that you can't understand it. The Word of God is written in plain, simple language with everything in plain view for you to study and for you to understand it. I've said to you so many times on this program, the key to understanding the Bible is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. The world today is a buzz. Uh, the, 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 the book and the movie, The Da Vinci Code, Got, got, got such press and such popularity because people are always looking for some mystery, some secret code to open the mysteries of life. Can I tell you that code is in God's Word and it's, it's not something that you can't find. It's something that you can understand and you don't have to spend uh, the, the, uh, the hours in cryptology to find it. All you need to do is spend some time doing what Second Timothy says, study. And as you study God's Word, you know what happens with God's Word? It demonstrates itself to be reliable. In fact, as you study the Word of God, you begin to see that from Genesis to Revelation, the Word of God is an integrated whole. Sixty-six books written by 40-plus authors over 2,000 years of human history. And yet it has one underlying message. Uh, in in computer talk, they call it macro codes, macros. A macro is sort of like, it's, it's, the, it's the overall structure of a thought or a pattern. You, you have uh, templates, for example. Uh, if you want to write a letter, if you, you, you put up your, your word processing, pro processing program and it says you want to write a letter, the little dude, dude jigger comes up in, you know, in Word XP and he says, are you trying to write a letter? I got a template for you. And that template is a macro. In other words, if you're going to do this, here is the outline of how that needs to be done. And they've pre-written those things for you. Uh, if you go to the auto show, you'll see a prototype in engineering. That is, here's the concept design, the prototype of what it's going to really be when we get it done. Well, macro codes, prototypes, in the Bible it's called typology. That is, there is a pattern there are some things that, are, that, that, that run all the way through the Word of God, no matter who the, who the human author is, that demonstrate that behind the scenes there's a divine author. I like to say it demonstrates that the Bible is, is of extraterrestrial origin, the real E.T. Because the author is obviously aware of information that the human author in his circumstances and in his time frame it's way too big of a deal, too big of, a, of an understanding. That there's a supernatural hand weaving of a broader tapestry than just what you see in the local time and circumstance event. I want you to see that because there's some tremendous things. If you, you begin to see these things and appreciate them for what they are, your confidence in the Word of God becomes founded in truth 
in empirical evidence. You see, we don't believe the Bible's the word of God because we just take some existential Kierkegaardian leap into the dark. This isn't faith in the worldly sense. This is faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We studied the Bible. We studied the word of God. And it has proven itself to us as being true. I tell people that about the Bible version issue. You know, if you, if you want to know which Bible you ought to use, I believe you should just believe the one you're using. And if you're using an, a New International Version or a New American Standard Version or, or the Holman Bible or any Bible that's been produced in the last 150 years, your Bible will demonstrate itself to you conclusively and, possi and, 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 and uh, uh, positively that it has errors in it. Now, you've got one of two things you can do. You can either believe the Bible doesn't have errors, and therefore you don't have, an, have a reliable copy of God's Word. Or you can believe that since my, the Bible I'm using has errors in it, it tells me the Bible is not infallible. Now, which one of those should you believe? Well, if you study your Bible, any Bible, it will tell you the Word of God should be infallible. So if you have a copy of it that has errors in it, then you know that the copy you have isn't infallible. You know there's only one Bible in the English language you, you can use that will pass that test. If you're using a New American Standard Version today or a New International Version or a Good News to Modern Man or, or the Living Bible or the Holman Bible, did you know that in Hebrews chapter number 3, your Bible says that everybody that came out of Egypt died in the wilderness while your six-year-old six Sunday school kid knows better than that? Did you know that your Bible says in Mark chapter 1 verse 2 that Isaiah wrote a verse that's really in Malachi? Can't even get the cross-references right. You know what the scholars say? They say, well, Mark wrote it wrong, but the, the scribes fixed it. Hello. I mean, if holy men of old wrote originally, as the Spirit of God gave them, uh, uh, spake as the Holy Ghost, as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, you mean God the Holy Spirit forgot where he wrote Malachi 3.1 and thought that he wrote it in Isaiah? And some bumbling scribe, some bumbling human like you came along and fixed it for the Almighty? I mean, you've got to have more degrees in temperature and have spent a whole lot of money and be invested in what you're doing to believe some nonsense like that. Just some ordinary person like you knows better than that, don't you? So when you read Mark 1, 2 in a King James Bible and it says it's written in the prophets and it's quoting Malachi and Isaiah and you read it in a good news to modern men, I don't care who recommended it to you. You just read it for what it's worth. You know your Bible when it says it's written in Isaiah and it's really Malachi and the cross reference in the center column tell you that it is. You know that your Bible has got a mistake in it. And just by believing it and, and using it, it'll demonstrate which one you should believe and which one you shouldn't. You see, the power in the Bible is in being familiar with it. And when you do that, you begin to find that there are wonderful things in Scripture that demonstrate that God had already laid out His plan for the redemption of mankind. He already had His plan and His purpose for all the ages already planned out before anything ever came along, before ever, anything was ever done. And the evidence that the Bible is an integrated message system 66 books written by 40 authors over 2,000 years period of time and yet containing one underlying message, obviously authored by one, who knew the end from the beginning and that every jot and every tittle is a part of a, of a tightly engineered design tailored for our learning, for our discovery, And for our edification, for our amazement. Let me give you an illustration. The first book in the Bible, Adam and Eve, they sin. And what do they do? Well, they go out and try to cover themselves up by making an apron out of fig leaves. They covered themselves with the works of their own hands. You know what man's been trying to do before God ever since? That's what we call that religion, Operation Fig Leaf. Cover himself before God. Did it work? No. God said, you're naked. 
Your works won't cover you before God. But you know what in Genesis 3 God did? God covered them. But what did he cover them with? He slew innocent blood and took the coat of an animal whose blood was shed, innocent blood, and God taught him in Genesis 3 that, there, that he would provide a covering through the shedding of innocent blood. Now that would became an ordinance and a code in the Levitical system, and it actually became a fulfillment on the cross of Calvary. But what Jesus Christ was doing on the cross of Calvary is in macro form back there in Genesis chapter 3. That's called a type, a prototype. God had it in mind all along. And by the way, you really don't understand what happened at the cross until you come to Paul even after that. And Paul says, let me tell you about a secret that God had. That if he'd ever told anybody about what he was going to do through the cross work of Christ, Satan wouldn't have crucified Christ. So he kept it a secret till he revealed it through me. And yet you go back to Genesis 3 and you see God had it in mind all along. Genesis 5 is, is, is a good verse to look at. You hear a lot about the, the so-called Gnostic Gospels and how there ought to be books in the Bible that, that aren't there because the Bible just went by oral tradition and oral transmission. Look at Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. This is the book of the generation of, of Adam. It says the book. That is, they had a written record. You see, they weren't going by oral tradition. It's not an orally transmitted. It's a written down record in a book. Genesis 3. Moses, Acts 7 says, was schooled in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Moses wrote the book of Genesis. They had records. You read about all kind of books in the Old Testament scripture. They had a great public library system. That, could, that, that the facts in the scripture could be checked against. It was a public record system that could be known, and if it wasn't true, it could be challenged. That tells you about the veracity of it. In Genesis 5, as you go down through this chapter, what you find here, by the way, when it says the book of the generations of Adam, you see that expression, the book of the generations? If you look over at Matthew chapter 1, you'll see the second one of these books, Matthew chapter number 1. There's only two books, the book of the generations in the Bible. There are, by the way, seven, 14 times that the Bible talks about the generations. Look, look over at chapter, Genesis chapter 6, verse number 9. These are the generations of Noah. Look at chapter 10, verse 1. These are the generations of the sons of Noah. If you go back to chapter number 2 of Genesis, you'll see he says these are the generations of the heaven and the earth. So the generations, 14 times you have the, the generations of, the generations of, the generations of. 13 of them are in the, what we call the Old Testament. The 14th and the final one is Matthew 1 verse 1. The book, and it's the second one that's a book, of the generation of Jesus Christ the son of David, the son of Abraham. So there are really two books of the generation. The one that Jesus wrote is the 14th. How do you reckon all the different people in the Old Testament that, that recorded the books, so there are 11 of them in the book of Genesis, of the book of, of the generations, the generations of the generations, and there are 11 in Genesis, how do you think that two more people in the Bible, centuries later, knew to write two more down so that when you come to Christ you'd have the 14th one? 14 is 2 times 7. The witness to the divinity of the deity and the perfection of Christ. <coughs> well, the reason it was because really one author wrote all those. Not two or four or six. And they're writing one trail of evidence. It's, a, it's an integrated message system that no matter where you go in the Bible, you find the information, regardless of what century it was written in, regardless of what, who, whose, whose penmanship was there, it's really God himself writing the thing because he's got a stream of information to put all the way through it. Now, in Genesis chapter number 5, he talks about the generations. There are ten of them in, in this passage. Probably the one that's the most interesting is down in verse number 23. 
Uh, I'll start in verse number 20, uh, 21. And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. Now you know who Methuselah is. Methuselah is the oldest man that ever lived. And when you talk about Methuselah, he lived 969 years. Now Enoch begat Methuselah. So Enoch is Methuselah's daddy. And the text says there that when Enoch was sixty and five years old, he begat Methuselah. So when he begat Methuselah, Enoch is 65. Then Methuselah has a kid. Uh, if you go down with me to uh, verse number 25. And Methuselah lived 180 and 7 years and begat Lamech. So when Methuselah is 187 years, he has a kid. And his kid, Lamech, goes out there. Verse number 28. And Lamech lived 182 years and begat a son, and he, he called his name Noah. So after Lamech has lived 182 years, he has Noah. And then Noah is born. And Noah lives for 600 years. And if you come down to verse number 30, uh, I'm sorry, the verse 31. And all the days of Lamech were 770 and 7 years, and he died. And Noah lived 500 years, was, was, was 500 years old, and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now come with me over, if you will, to chapter number uh, 7, Genesis 7, verse 11. And in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month... And the seventeenth day of the month, the same day, were all the fountain, foundation, uh, fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were open, and rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. When Noah was six hundred years old, the flood came. Now why is that important? Well, there's some interesting things that go on out here with these guys, and especially this guy Methuselah. He's 187 years old here, but he, did, he lived for 969 years. So that means that he lived what? 969 minus 187, that's 2. 8 from 6 is 8, and 1 from 8 is 7. Is that right? Did I do that right? Somebody tell me if I didn't do it right. I can't count change sometimes. He lived 900, there's 9, 8 and 8 is 6, 8 and 1 is 9. He lived 969 years. He lived 187 years, begat Lamech, and after that he lived 782 more years out here. Now, why is that important? Well, what happens back, something happened back here in connection with the birth of Methuselah. Look back at verse number 21. And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God, underline the next word, after he begat Methuselah three hundred years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were three hundred and sixty and five years. So Enoch lives three hundred more, uh, Noah, uh, I'm sorry, Enoch lives three hundred more years. And after three hundred years, something happened to him. And he was not... For God took him. So he gets taken out after 365 years. Methuselah, by the way, Methuselah's name means when he dies, it shall come. After he dies, it shall come. His death shall bring it. God taught Enoch something. You know what Enoch did? He's a preacher of righteousness. He preached about the wrath of God going to come over here against ungodly sinners and destroy them. God gave Enoch some information, and he gave him a sign in the, death of his son, in the birth of his son. And he said, as long as Methuselah is alive, the, the, the judgment won't come. But when Methuselah dies, then it's going to come. And you know what you have? You have in the genealogies here the exact timing 
Because the year Methuselah dies is the year the flood comes down here. And you see that timing going out there, and you say, gee willikers, isn't that interesting? Because if you, add, if you add these numbers up here, you know what you get? You get that number right there. 187, 182, 600 is right there. That is, from the birth of Methuselah to the death of Methuselah is exactly the same time as, as from the birth of Methuselah right down here through Noah to the flood. The year Methuselah died, the flood came. God gave warning to Enoch about the judgment and the long suffering of God waiting in the days of Noah. Actually waiting a lot longer than that. And he gave a prototype of some people getting out, being delivered before the wrath comes. So these generations back here in Genesis have a lot of things to say to you as you read them that are prototypes. One of the ones that I think is most fascinating is, 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 is held in the names of these guys. Because when you, when you read down through those ten names in, the, in this chapter, you find an interesting set of circumstances. The, the, the names uh, start out with Adam. Now the name Adam, uh, it means man. And that's not hard to understand. Adam is, is man. The next one there is Seth. And the name Seth means appointed. The appointed one. After Seth... Comes, comes Enos. And Enos means mortal. Mortal. And after Enos, uh, Enos comes uh, uh, Canaan. And that, means, that name means sorrow. If you, the way you get the definition of these names is you look up the, the root words that the names come from. Then, I, then after him comes Mahaliel. And that means the blessed God. The blessed God, you see, you almost see uh, uh, hallelujah in, in, in that name. Then after him comes Jared, and Jared means um, it's going to come down. After Jared is, uh, is Enoch, and Enoch... The seventh from, from Adam, uh, his name means teacher or teaching. Then after him is Methuselah, and, and Methuselah means his death. Methu is Hebrew for death. Uh, uh, his death, Selah, means to come. So his death shall bring. After Methuselah is, is, is Lamech, and Lamech means the despairing one, despair. You see the word lamentation and lament in his name. And then Noah means to rest or be comforted. Now that's the meaning of the names of these guys. Those guys are, are in the Bible because that's their birth order. That's how their parents named them. That's the way they are. They're listed there. But when you look at that, you say, what have you got? Isn't that interesting? Man, who is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing rest. You want to do that again? Man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring despairing, the despairing rest. Now you tell me something. There isn't any way under God's heaven or in your wildest hallucination that when Moses wrote that down, he had any idea what he was writing down. He was just writing down a bunch of names. There's, not, there's no Jewish rabbi in some cloistered monastery somewhere or in some back room writing those names down that had any idea what was going on there. But when you read the meaning of those names, you know what you're reading? You're reading a message that God himself had kept secret until he revealed it to the Apostle Paul. And yet you're reading the fact that God had it in mind all along. The only explanation 
for that kind of thing in the Bible over and over and over and over. These macrotypes, these, these types, these prototypes, these messages in God's Word. The only explanation for that is that when they were written, they were written by someone who did not, who was not bound by the constraints of time and circumstances like human authors are. It's someone beyond the time-space continuum that you and I live in. It was God himself. And God has fixed this book so that wherever you look, you find the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you find the Lord Jesus Christ, what you find is that God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Someone said, you cut the Bible and it bleeds, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the wisdom of God in a mystery. You want a you code that will unlock the mysteries of life for you? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll find it. Jesus said, search the scriptures for they are they that testify of me. That's where you'll find eternal life. That's why you'll find truth. That's why you'll find the ultimate basis of reality. Because reality is bigger than the time and space continuum you live in. And God's word is the expression. Jesus said, thy word is truth. That's more than just saying it's right all the time. It's that without question. But it's the ultimate basis of all reality and life. And God gives you that life in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you trust him, he is the word of God. God will save you, give you life that lives in you victoriously for His glory. Till we meet again at the same time next week, Maranatha.